so for this week we're going to be talking about rhythmic developments in the 20th and 21st century. A lot of this stuff might be a review. We're going to start with the concept of simple and compound time signatures and then expand from there. So the first thing you need to know are your time signatures. We're going to start by talking about the ways that we can classify musical time, the types of subdivision, simple time signatures, compound time signatures, and then we'll get into a brief discussion of complex and irregular time signatures. So these are all concepts that you should already understand, but I think it's important to just briefly go over these concepts to make sure that we're all on the same page. So when we're classifying time signatures, obviously time signatures provide specific information that informs your musician how many beats are in a measure and the note value that is given one beat. But there are more general methods of identifying a time signature. So normally we'd classify a time signature by common time, cut time, three, four, different methods that are very specific. They tell you the exact number of beats in the measure and the beat that gets one, or the note value that gets one beat. But you can also subdivide them more generally. So with simple time, that occurs when the subdivision of the beat is divided into two equal parts with more than one beat in the measure. So what that means is obviously a 1-4 time signature would not be simple time. It would be something else. So typical examples of simple time are 2-4, 3-4, 4-2, time signatures of that nature. Additionally, you've got compound time. So that's when you have the subdivision of the beat that's divided into three equal parts with more than one beat in the measure. So when this happens, the music's said to be in compound time. So some examples of that are 6-8, 9-8, and 6-4. Compound time tends to have a triple fill, while simple time tends to have a duple fill. So anything that doesn't fit into simple or compound time, we can call complex or irregular time. Two different terms basically mean the same thing. So when the subdivision of the beat alternates between two and three equal parts, the music is going to be in complex time. So an example of that would be 5-4, 11-16, and 7-8. And obviously, once we start getting into the 19th century music and 20th century and 21st century music, we start to combine all kinds of different time signatures, and in often, in a lot of cases, the time signature will simply be completely removed. So in addition to classifying a time signature as simple, compound or complex, we can also classify it as duple, triple, or quadruple. So duple, triple, and quadruple only applies to simple and compound time signatures. Complex time signatures are just complex. It means they don't fit the definition of simple or compound time. So time signatures can be in duple, triple, or quadruple, and this refers to the number of beats in the measure. So in duple time, you have two beats in a measure. In triple, you have three beats in a measure. And in quadruple, you have four beats in a measure. So common time would be simple quadruple. So here's a few examples of simple time signatures. When a piece of music is written in simple time, the main beat can be subdivided into two smaller and equal beats, kind of like you see in the image up there. Typically, the subdivided notes are eighth notes and are connected with a beam over the top of the notes. Remember, there are some simple time signatures where the eighth note or some other note value functions as a beat for the music. Of course, I think this is something that we all understand, so I'm just going to quickly go through this. So, your most common simple time signatures are grouped into two, three, or four beats. If the time signature doesn't have a two, three, or a four as a top beat, it's not considered simple time. That's an easy way to determine whether or not you are dealing with simple time. You have to have a two, three, or a four as a top number. So three, four has three beats per measure. The beat is a quarter note, and the subdivision is two eighth notes per measure. In 4-4 four, four time, there's going to be four beats per measure, the beat is a quarter note, and the subdivision is also two eighth notes per beat. 
in 3-8 time. The, there are three beats per measure. The beat is the eighth note, and the subdivision is two sixteenth notes per beat. 3-8 time is one that often confuses people. They sometimes think it's a compound time signature, but we classify it as a simple time signature. In 2-2 two two time, you have two beats per measure. The beat is a half note, and the subdivision is two quarter notes per beat. So essentially, with simple time, all of these time signatures can be divided down into two smaller subdivisions. And then you've got 316 and 48. So hopefully this concept is pretty simple. So let's just do a little bit of a test on this, make sure you guys are following. So in a simple time signature, what type of time signature is 2-4? You can pause it if you need to, if you need to think about this. But 2-4 is a simple duple time signature. So the way you identify it is by saying it's simple, and then you provide the classification of the beat. So simple duple. So for 4-4, four, four, that would be a simple quadruple time signature. 3-16 is also a simple triple time signature. So with compound time signatures, the beat in a compound time signature is subdivided into three equally spaced beats. Compound time signatures are generally more advanced time signatures and typically only taught after musicians have mastered simple time signatures, but essentially there are going to be two parts to a compound time signature. The time signature type which is compound, and the number of beats in the measure. In a compound quadruple time signature, there are going to be four beats in the measure. The compound clarifier indicates that the subdivision of the beat is broken down into three smaller equal beats. So for 12-4 time, that's a compound time signature because we have four beats in the measure and the beat is a dotted half note. So the subdivision is going to be three quarter notes per beat. So since there's three quarter notes per beat, that is a triple feel, so that would be considered compound. Same with 9-8. You've got three beats per measure, the beat is about a quarter note, and the subdivision is three eight notes per beat. In 6-4 time, you've got two beats per measure, the beat is actually the dotted half note, and the subdivision is three quarter notes per beat. Even though we, in these compound time signatures, we have a 12, 9, or 6 on top, we consider them compound because we're dividing them into groups of three. So in 12, 16, you've got four beats per measure. The beat is a dotted eighth note. The subdivision is three sixteenth notes per beat. And then just one of the more common ones, six, eight time signature. You've got two beats per measure. The beat is a dotted half note. And the subdivision is three eighth notes per beat. So, what type of time signature is 12-4? It's going to be a compound quadruple time signature. And if it still isn't clear, what you do is you simply divide the 12 by the number 3, since the beat is a dotted half note, to arrive at four sets of three subdivisions. So then anything that's not simple or compound, we simply call complex or irregular. These time signatures include everything else. So a quick way you can classify these is to just use some basic math here. So first you have to determine the division of the beat. So in simple time, if the top number of a time signature is a two, three, or four, it is simple time. For compound time, if the top number of a time signature is a six, nine, or a 12, it is some type of compound time. Complex time is if the top number is anything else, that makes it complex. So once you de de determine the division of the beat, you have to determine the division of the meter. If the beat is in simple time, then use the top number to determine if it's duple, triple, or quadruple. 2, 4 is simple duple because there is a 2 on top. 3, 4 is simple triple because there is a 3. Same for 3, 8. That is also simple triple. There's a lot of confusion about 3-8 because it kind of looks like a 6-8 time signature. People assume it's a compound time signature, but it is not. We classified in three.
and if you've ever conducted, you understand why that is. We often don't think of a 3-8 time signature in terms of one beat per measure. We tend to think of it in terms of three beats per measure, unless it's extremely fast. If the beat is in compound time, then you divide the top number by three to determine if it's duple, triple, or quadruple. So, 12, four is compound quadruple because 12 divided by three is four. Nine, eight is compound triple because nine divided by three is three. Okay, so that's it for the basic review of simple, compound, and complex time signatures. If you don't know this information, you should do a little bit of research to try and figure out how this works. I have another lecture in my Music 102 series that's also available on YouTube. It's in Unit 3. You can go through an entire presentation that tells you how to identify simple, compound, and complex time signatures, if that's necessary. So now we're going to talk about isochronous and non-isochronous uh, time signatures here. In the classical and early romantic period, music was primarily isochronous, which means that the beats are evenly spaced. So basically, you break that word down into iso, which means same, chronos, which means time. So everything in isochronous time signatures tends to have an equally divided beat. In music after 1900, music starts to become non-isochronous. This occurs with beats that are less predictable. Some beats may have two equal subdivisions, while others have three. So an example would be a 5-8 time signature. Most of your complex time signatures are going to be considered non-isochronous. And this is the main reason why you need to understand the difference between simple, compound, and complex is because the simple and compound time signatures are considered to be isochronous and the complex or irregular time signatures are considered to be non-isochronous. So the next thing we're going to talk about is asymmetrical rhythm. And this actually has to do with isochronous and non-isochronous time signatures. So first of all, your isochronous time signatures, just once again to be very clear, those are going to be 2, 4, 3, 4, 6, 8, basically all of your simple and compound meters. So all of these time signatures are going to have both isochronous beats and isochronous divisions of the beat. So non-isochronous time signatures are going to be all your complex time signatures. These are also considered asymmetrical meters. They have non-isochronous be beats, but they tend to have isochronous divisions because you can still divide the individual beat into groups of two or three. So a 5-8 time signature might be non-isochronous, but it can be divided into groups of three and two, and then those groups of three and two, the eighth note is still divided into two smaller subdivisions, if that makes sense. So with common practice music, both the notation and perception of meter tend to be the same. So audience can usually detect the meter with good reliability. You might come into some difficulty with a piece that's in 4-4 or 2-2, but for the most part, you can agree with what's written and what you hear. You can reconcile what the notation with what you're actually hearing. When we get into 20th and 21st century music, the difference between notated meter and the perceived rhythm may not match. So often what happens is the meter in 20th and 21st music is determined by performance considerations. So notation will often be geared towards what's easiest for the performer to understand and comprehend rather than how does the audience perceive the music. So we've gone away from using strict regimented beats and regular divisions of time and we're starting to go towards more irregular music. In some ways it's even a little more natural because the time signatures tend to be a little more flexible and you can't always tell just by listening to a piece what the time signature is if there is a time signature at all. So we're going to talk a little bit about Webern, his five movements for string quartet, 
This is Opus 5, number 4, so we're going to talk about the fourth movement. And we're going to hear a recording here. Okay, so that recording also included a cat soloist that wasn't in the actual recording. But basically, the idea is, how would you conduct this piece if you didn't have the notation? You wouldn't necessarily know how to do it. And you wouldn't necessarily know what time signature you should use either. So the notation doesn't always match what we hear. Some people might conduct it in four. Other people might want to conduct it in two. But this piece is actually in 3-4, and so a conductor would likely conduct it in 3. But we wouldn't necessarily know that unless we had the music in front of us. So the next concept is polymeter. So when two or more meters are heard simultaneously, it's known as polymeter. You can notate polymeter with different time signatures that occur simultaneously. So you might have a 2-4 and a 3-4 time signature. In this case, if you play the entire 3-4 time signature, you'd have the first half of the 2-4 time signature and the next beat of the 2-4 time signature occurring at the same time. So this can get kind of complex, and what it does is it displaces the rhythm in the music. So the effect of polymeter may also occur using a, a single time signature. This is where it becomes a little more difficult to identify polymeter, is when you don't have the two different time signatures written in the music. Instead, what the composer will do is they will notate the music so that it sounds like it's maybe in 3-4 against 2-4. And sometimes they'll use accents and articulations, other times they'll use uh, phrase indicators, which kind of look like slurs, to show you how to phrase a melody. So this is a Stravinsky piece, and you'll look right at 82, you essentially have a 2-4 time signature in the violins, and then in the vocal part, you have what's equivalent of a 3-4 time signature. But this piece has been written completely in 2-4. However, when it's played back, the vocalist is going to sound like they're performing in a different time signature than what's happening in the rest of the ensemble. And as this piece goes on, you'll also hear accents that occur every three beats while the vocalist actually plays in 2-4 time. So if you go through this piece, you can actually find quite a few examples of polymeter. So the next thing we're going to talk about is ametric music. This is when the notated meter does not align into a regular beat at all. This results in the perception of no meter. It can be notated either with graphical notation or conventional notation, but you might see it either way. So this is a piece we've talked about quite a bit. At the bottom of the score are some instructions for the performer to play the piece strictly in time. But what ends up happening is when we listen to this, it ends up sounding like the piece uses a high amount of rubato. So it's actually kind of hard to tell what the time signature is, even though it's played strictly in time. And this is because the beat has been obscured using a lot of syncopation and delaying the downbeat in just about every single measure of the piece. And you're going to find very few instances in this piece where you actually have a downbeat that's articulated. So if you listen to this piece, you're going to hear what I mean by this. Oh, going backwards.
So you can hear the piece sounds very free flowing. It's very hard to actually identify what the time signature is. So this is an example of ametric music. Another thing that's done quite a lot, Messian, Messian is actually very famous for doing this in a lot of his music. It's additive rhythm, sometimes called added values. So essentially what happens here is we add additional notes to what would otherwise be a fairly standard time signature. So if you look at the first and the second measure, the second measure metrically makes sense. You basically have four complete beats in the measure. But in the first one, there's an extra 16th note that is added to the piece. So that makes this an additive rhythm because we've essentially added the rhythm to obscure the music. Messian actually refers to this as dots of addition. And what happens is these extra notes in a simple time signature, they'd be balanced out to make the time signature equal. And so you have equal number of beats in the entire measure. But with additive rhythm, the time signatures really don't exist and it starts to become changed based on how the additive rhythm is used. So it can be written without a meter indicated and usually it is. Measures would often correspond to a standard time signature if it wasn't for the added rhythm. And as you can see in the example below, the 16th note value stays the same, but the rhythm continues to change. And that's a pretty common characteristic of additive rhythm. One smaller subdivision will stay the same, but the beat becomes unpredictable because we're, we have these constant additions to the rhythmic values that don't necessarily make sense or are predictable. And it creates a very free flowing sound. So some people refer to this as a palindrome. The more theoretical term is non-retrogradable rhythm. This is a technique that is often added to additive rhythm. So you'll often find this in conjunction with additive rhythm. If you look at this example here, this is a very simple example of a palindrome. It's played the same way whether you start from the last note and play backwards or you start from the first note and play forwards. So these palindromes basically sound the same forward and backward. This is kind of an interesting concept. It's proportional notation. And this is where it may seem like we have a series of quarter notes that are just played consecutively. So here we have nine quarter notes. If you were to perform this and you didn't know about proportional notation, you might just play the nine quarter notes equally divided. So that's more or less nine equally spaced quarter notes. But the way proportional notation works is the other note values are played based on where they appear in the music. So typically we play these all the same, but the distance between the notes determines how long to hold each note. So that second beat is actually going to be held for the longest period of time. So you might play this as... something like that. But every performer is going to play it a little bit differently because it's just proportional notation. It gives a lot of freedom in how to actually interpret the music. And this, usually it's a melodic idea. It's not usually just a rhythmic idea. But this gives the performer a lot of freedom to interpret the music. So this is proportional notation because the music is to be played without rhythm and note values are played depending on the spacing of the individual notes. In this example, once again, the second note would be held the longest since it occupies the most space. So our next example, and the last example we're going to talk about, 
is tempo modulation or metric modulation. So with tempo modulation, the tempo is changed, which effectively changes the rhythm in a composition. In the past, we used to call this metric modulation, but since the tempo is really the thing that's being affected and the meter isn't really the primary goal, the goal is to change the tempo, not necessarily the meter, a lot of more modern theory textbooks refer to this as tempo modulation. So one note value is held constant, which results in a metric modulation in the next section. So in this piece, you start out with metronome marking, the beat equals 84 beats per minute, and then you take the half note value and turn it into the dotted half note value in the next measure, and then you take the quarter note value from the second measure and make it the quarter note in the third measure. So what this does is it ends up changing the tempo based on both the time signature and the tempo. So in addition to the reading for this chapter, the goal is for you to use these terms to try and analyze more music that I'm going to give you over the course of the semester. There will also be an assignment you can complete online in web campus and that will be due in about two weeks. I'm going to make assignments due about every two weeks to give you plenty of time to get into the score really thoroughly. So that assignment will be posted by Thursday of this week. And of course, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me. If you're a student, make sure you use Web Campus. It just makes it easier for me to keep track of all the correspondence.